We are in the third week of our series that we're calling Stay Focused. And this is really something that uh, I've just wanted to uh, use to set the course for our faith family going forward from here. Uh, The scriptures teach that every single day, you and I are striving after a kingdom, one of two kingdoms, actually, either a kingdom of self or the kingdom of God. We're always living for one or the other of those kingdoms. We're either living for ourselves, living for the Lord. And sometimes our allegiance to a particular kingdom changes throughout the day, even uh, multiple times throughout the day. So one moment you're living and you're praising God, you're, you're driving down Blue Angel Parkway and you're just singing praises to God while you're driving and then someone cuts you off And all of the sudden, living for God in that moment doesn't become the most important thing to you, right? Am I the only one in here that that doesn't? No, I'm not. I know I'm not. You can lie, but you really can't. Um, The Lord knows. In that moment, oftentimes our hearts drift from living for the kingdom of God to living for self. When um, the pressure is put on us, what comes out reveals what is in us. Okay? Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? When my heart is all about me, well, then self-centeredness comes out. And it comes out in your heart as well. You see, each of us is susceptible to being knocked off course in our living for the Lord. And at times, it's the world around us the various offerings that it presents to us, temptations, stresses, things that come our way. But I think if we were honest, most of the time, the problem isn't out there. The problem is in here. Our hearts wander. Our hearts are attracted to the the comforts of worldliness. We like the ease of selfishness. We like the satisfaction of self-righteousness. And so the Bible warns us we have to stay vigilant. We have to stay focused, which is why we're doing this series. I want us to stay focused, Point Family. God wants us to stay focused. And this morning, Psalm 127 is going to show us that part of being focused, part of staying focused, is understanding what we are responsible for, and what we're not responsible for. Sometimes that's half the battle that we face. We like to take on things that God does not hold us responsible for while neglecting things that he does hold us responsible for. So if you have your place in Psalm 127, I want you to read along with me as I read God's word. The psalmist says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise early, up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Let's pray. Father, we have read your word, and we truly believe it is your word. And so in this moment, let's pray that you would work by your spirit in our hearts change us as we spend this time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, we're looking at one of these psalms that's part of this collection that we call the Songs of Ascent. Uh, These were the songs that Israelite travelers would sing on their way to Jerusalem, uh, and then uh, they would continue singing them as they headed to the temple for worship. It was a really good way to prepare their own hearts to come before the living God. And you can see why this psalm's general message was was helpful in making sure that the worshipers approached God with humility and thanksgiving. 
broadly speaking, it's saying that everything we strive to do, if the Lord's not in it, there's no point to it. It's in line with what we talked about last week, that we're all in need, and one of the primary things that we must realize is that need, that we, we must recognize that need. But before we dive into the specifics of Psalm 20, 127, I want to set the stage for you uh, how we're going to approach this, because I think that there are actually two levels of understanding when it comes to Psalm 127. There is, you can, you can think of these kind of as concentric circles here. You've got the outer circle that is really a broad, general understanding of the passage that you get from just reading quickly through it. Then there's this more focused understanding, a smaller, narrower understanding that ties to Jesus and eventually to us as the church. So I want to begin with the wider circle, that, that basic level of understanding that comes from just us clearly, or, or just from reading this psalm just uh, fairly quickly. And what we see in Psalm 127 is that it divides into two parts. Verses 1 and 2 form the first part, and then verses 3 through 5 form the second. In the first part, so in verses 1 through 2, the message is clear. Whatever we do, we do in vain if the Lord is not in it. It's in vain if he's not empowering our efforts or guarding our steps. The word vain is, it has the idea of emptiness or futility. It, it, it doesn't last um, scripture also uses this word to talk about the pain and the toil that come when we turn away from the Lord and we do things his way. So in one sense, the psalmist is saying that to build or watch over something with great intensity, it's ultimately fruitless if the Lord is not building and watching as well. So there's that one sense. The second sense is that he's saying, if you do those things, if you build and you watch and you, you strive after these things, but you don't account for the Lord, then you're going to experience the pain that comes when men and women turn from God. So in general, what verse 1 is saying is that building something without the Lord is a waste of your time. To begin with, God is the one who provides opportunity. He provides the skill that we need. He provides the resource, the motivation. He provides the leadership. All of these different aspects that come to building, that come with building something, he provides. So if we don't include him in the process, we're doing it in a fruitless way. God's also supposed to be the motivation. He doesn't just provide the motivation. He is the motivation. He's supposed to be, at least when we do things. So when he's not... Even if, if we do things, even if we accomplish great things, these things only condemn us because we've been living for our little self-centered kingdoms, right? We strive and we strive and we strive, and then when we get to the end of our lives and we stand before the king, we have nothing to offer him because it's all been done for us. And then in that moment, the vanity of all of our efforts is very clearly shown. The same goes for the way that we guard the various things in our lives. No matter how diligent you are, no matter how prepared you are for any and every danger in your life, there's no one in this room who has the power to fully protect what's precious to you. That's what the second part of verse 1 is saying. Your family, your job, your retirement, your marriage, your health, all of them are outside of your ability to completely guard against harm. And you know this already. We see this around us. Maybe we experience it. Well-loved spouses still leave. Well-raised children still rebel. Well-planned investments still crash. Well-fed bodies still get sick. You can seemingly have an answer for every scenario that you might possibly um, think of. And yet, at least one other thing is going to come up and slip by. Because you're not the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God of the universe. It's an empty hope to believe that you can perfectly protect whatever is precious in your life. And what that hopelessness leads to is the painful, anxious life that's described in verse 2. Look at it, he says, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, 
for he gives to his beloved sleep. There's a difference in the way that a person works when they believe that the weight of the world is on their shoulders. There's a a difference in the way that a person spends his time when he thinks that everything depends upon him. You want to shake that person in that moment. You want to grab his shoulders and shake him and, and tell him it doesn't all depend upon you. But then as you do that, you're remembering that you yourself do that, right? You yourself try to take on the weight of the world. So you stay up later than you should because you have to check off one more box to make sure it gets done. You get up super early because everything simply must be perfect. And you run your body into the ground because you refuse to believe that you have the limits that everyone else does. That is not the way that God intends for you to live. Now, some of you are going to start thinking that I really like to talk about sleep because this is the second week that I've talked about it in a row. Um, But it just so happens that the passages that we're uh, reviewing, um, God likes to use them to remind us of our limitations. God loves to remind his people that they are limited beings. And he does that because our limitations are meant to keep us focused. They're meant to make us look away from ourselves for help. You are not supposed to be able to do everything because you're not supposed to do everything. You're not supposed to be able to keep going without ever stopping because sometimes God wants you to stop. Verse 2 says that sleep is a gift from God. It's an expression of his love to his people, which means that If, as I said last week, prayerlessness is a symptom of not trusting God, then verse 2 teaches that sleeplessness is also a symptom of not trusting God. That's not to say that long days or long nights can't be had for the glory of God, but it is to say when they are fueled by worry and anxiety, a line has been crossed. Don't think that God is impressed by you abusing your body to accomplish one more task out of fear and anxiousness. He's not impressed by that. He doesn't see that as a commitment. He sees that as unbelief. Most of the time, children have to learn to sleep, right? You've raised children, you know, most of the time they have to learn to sleep. Now, if you were one of those that was blessed with children that uh, slept from the very beginning, like God bless you, none of us want to hear about it. Like no one wants to hear about that. It's wonderful. Praise to God. But most of the time, you have to sleep train, right? Children have to learn that even when they're not awake, their parents are still watching over them. In the same way, the Lord wants you to trust him enough to close your eyes and rest, to leave things in his hands, to embrace that you can't do it all, and to trust that he's going to take care of you. In a world of exhaustion and restlessness, in this world that surrounds us, that is anxious and restless, that kind of restful living stands out. That kind of living makes others stop and wonder wonder why you can work and live and rest without constantly being wearied and worried. Which means, if you are constantly wearied and worried, and some of you are, then it might be time for a heart check it might be time to consider whether or not you are trusting in yourself or trusting in God. You're probably making time or making yourself responsible for things that God does not hold you responsible for. And you're probably neglecting things that he does. If you know you belong to the creator of heaven and earth, and you know he's your keeper, then you can build and you can watch and you can sleep. One of the primary ways this plays out is in the daily life of the family, which is where the psalmist goes next in verses 3 through 5. He says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quivers with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Throughout the scriptures, children are always seen as a blessing, a gift from the Lord. They were part of his original command to uh, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. 
In several places, the Old Testament promised the blessing of children and and commanded that they be raised to know and follow the Lord. In the New Testament, Jesus welcomes the children, blesses them. In the New Testament, we also have Paul's letters, some of which uh, speak directly to parents. In other words, unlike ancient culture and sometimes our culture itself, the biblical viewpoint has always been that children are a gift from God to be received with joy and raised with purpose. And after talking about living and working without panic or anxiousness, the psalmist points to children as an example of God's care. I don't want you to misunderstand verse 3. Verse 3 sometimes is pulled out of its context and used in a wrong way. It is not teaching that some are rewarded with children because they obey while others don't because they don't. That's not what the Bible is teaching here. You have to remember that in the Old Testament, there were blessings and curses related to Israel's obedience or disobedience as a nation. God promised in Deuteronomy 28 that if the nation as a whole followed the Lord and kept walking in his ways, then he would would bless them with children. If they didn't, he wouldn't. He would close the wombs of the women of the nation so that they could not continue to increase in population while they increased in sin. So I think that's the background here to verse 3. And what the psalmist is saying is that as a man looks around at his children, he can see that God is fulfilling his promise to build up and guard his people. He could see the Lord using children to prosper families. He could see the Lord using children to preserve families and provide them a stable future. Through children, men and women were cared for in their old age. Through them, the nation kept going. It kept, it kept growing bigger and bigger. And when enemies came against God's people to accuse them or take stuff from them, they could point to the children and know that God was for them. They could know that God was still on their side. The gate in verse 5 was typically where legal issues were handled in that day. So if there was a conflict to be dealt with, the city gate was where people would meet up to handle it. So a man with many children had allies on his side. They could, they could answer for him. They could help defend him. If, if he was in need, they could pool their resources together to take care of him. That's why Solomon says that the man who fills his quiver with them is blessed. In general, such a blessed man was one part of an overall demonstration that God was for the Israelites. So that's the broad message of Psalm 127, that ultimately God's the one who gives success to his people and protects them from danger. So if you're living this morning a frantic life, as though everything depends upon you, as though you're living living life without God in the picture, then understand from the scriptures this morning, it's all going to be in vain if you continue in that. It's all going to be in vain. You cannot work enough in and of yourself to achieve anything that will last. And despite all your best efforts, you can't protect yourself and your loved ones from every threat in this world. You can't be vigilant enough. Your energy is going to run out. And there are things in this world that you are simply not strong enough to counteract. From helicopter parenting to micromanaging bosses, we all know this is not the way it's supposed to be. But the answer to these limitations isn't despair or giving up. Rather, it's building and working and living while trusting that in the end, your life and the lives of those around you ultimately depend upon the Lord. As we saw last week, He is your keeper. He's the one who watches over you personally, but he's also their keeper. The ones that you care for, the ones that you love, the ones that you worry about, he's their keeper too. The kids we dismissed just a little bit ago, like they remind us that the Lord is at work among us and he is their keeper. How much better working a job would be if we lived like that? How much better parenting would be if we parented like that? How much much sweeter our sleep would be if we rested like that? It's not on us. It's on him. 
So we can work and we can live and we can rest differently. Now, that's the broader application of Psalm 127. But I, as I said, I think there's a, a closer in level of understanding. So I want to take a few moments for us to kind of walk through it. And I say that because it begins with recognizing that Solomon is the writer of this song of ascent. This is Solomon writing Psalm 127. He doesn't write a single other song of ascent. It's just this one, particularly. And when you realize that, you start to filter your understanding of Psalm 127 through it. Recall, Solomon was the king of Israel. He was also the primary builder of the temple. And so from the very outset, I think it's likely that in verse 1, when he's talking about building the house, the house probably refers to the temple, a place where the priests would offer up sacrifices and the people would gather to hear from the Lord and to worship him. And Solomon knew from his experience leading the charge and building the temple that apart from the Lord equipping and resourcing his efforts, it never would have happened. It was God who had put it on his father David's heart to build a temple. It was God who had moved in the hearts of the Israelites to provide the resources and the riches to construct the temple. And it was God's good favor that he would use the temple to meet with sinful people. So the temple stood as a monument to the kindness and to the power of God toward his people. It wasn't about Solomon. It wasn't about Solomon's name being magnified. It was the Lord. And Solomon knew that regardless of any effort he put forth, had it not been for the Lord, he would have labored in vain. The same probably colored his, his view of his position as king, the one who is to protect the people. So when it mentions watchmen, staying awake. Well, one of the primary concerns that Solomon had as the king was to protect the people and to make sure the walls of Jerusalem were guarded well from invaders. He, it was under his leadership that the people slept and rested. And he knew that this was too big of, an, uh, too big of an, uh, an item for him to handle in and of himself. He knew that as the builder of the temple and the protector of the people, he needed the Lord if he was to have any measure of success. That's why even with all of that weighing upon him, Solomon knew that he didn't have to anxiously fret. He didn't have to rise early or go to bed late being anxious because if the Lord God Almighty wasn't in it, then it was for nothing in the first place. It was empty. It was useless. But he knew that God was in it. Remember, in Israel's history, Solomon that reign was amazing, the richest uh, of riches when it came to nations. There was a growing population, evidence that God was blessing the Israelites as they continued to follow his word. We also know that Solomon had a great fall. His heart began to turn away from the Lord, followed after other gods, and the people followed him into that. And so eventually, just as God had warned them for centuries, if you go away from me, if you start worshiping other gods, I will send you into exile. That's exactly what happened. The temple was burned, the walls were torn down, and all of those children who had marked the blessing of God upon the nation, they were sent into exile. They had been abandoned, relying on God. They had abandoned relying on God, and the consequences had come um, for them. So, that's Solomon. So we look at that as Christians, and we go, well, that really did not bring the ultimate fulfillment of this psalm. It doesn't sound like things would have uh, played out that way if this were true. But, as Christians, we see an even deeper meaning to Psalm 127. From this side of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, we know that God was not finished building. The temple had been destroyed, that's true, but we had known all along that God could not be housed in a temple made with human hands. No matter how grand, no matter how richly decorated the temple was, it was never meant to be the final dwelling place of God. That's why Jesus would later tell a woman at the well, listen, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. That's why I told the disciples, don't be enamored with all the impressive buildings here. Not even one stone is going to be left on another. 
Instead, Jesus was ushering in a new era between God and his people. Because Jesus was fully God and fully man, Jesus became the permanent meeting place between God and man in himself. God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, then came to dwell in every man, woman, and child who believed in Jesus, who was joined to Jesus through faith. This meant that individually and collectively, God's people became the very dwelling place of God. Every believer, when he or she believes in Jesus, when they place their faith in Jesus, has the Holy Spirit, God himself, come to dwell in them. And together, we as a church, not the building, we as the people of God are together the dwelling place of God. Pretty amazing. Unspeakably amazing. So in light of that, when we go back and we look at Psalm 127 through the lens of Jesus, we don't just see any house. We don't just see any temple. We see the church. We see the people of God. We see Jesus building his church just as he promised to do. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that believers were being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. And this whole structure was being joined together and growing into a holy temple in the Lord. We also see Jesus watching over his church, guarding his people against the assaults of the evils and temptations of their enemies. We see him blessing the church with more and more children, men and women and boys and girls coming to faith and being added to the family of God. Do you see how Jesus takes us from a very broad application of Psalm 127 to a very specific, a very close-in application for you and me as his church? More than a general truth about our need for God in every part of our life, Psalm 127 is a specific message to us about our need for God in every part of the church. Remember, the task before us as a faith family is to stay focused. Like, that's the whole point of this series. And we see in this passage that there are a number of core truths that can help us to do that. And I want you to to hear them. First, only as we rely on Christ will we see the church built. Only as we rely on Christ. He's the one transforming people's lives and leading others to surrender to him in faith. It's Jesus who brings new faith. It's Jesus who restores marriages. It's Jesus who reconciles enemies. It's Jesus and no one else, nothing else. It's Jesus. It's not my eloquence or charisma as if I had any. It's not your learnedness or experience. It's not a curriculum. It's not a strategy. It's not a ministry. It's not a music style. It's not a building. It's not a location. It is Jesus. Yes, you and I get to be used by him, but we should never fall into thinking that it's on us or could ever be by us that these things happen. He's the one building. He's the builder. We're the building. There's one savior. There's one head of the church, and I am not him, and you are not either. Which means that we don't get to determine when, or how, or why, or where the Lord chooses to work in and through his people in any given moment. So we have to stay a prayerful people, calling out to him, pleading that he would move on our behalf as he sees fit. We have to keep submitting to his word, knowing that his ways are much better than ours, his wisdom much higher than ours, his strength much stronger than ours. God forbid, listen to this, God forbid, that we succeed in building the point to be something other than his church because we've been building without letting the Lord do it his way. God forbid that we succeed in doing that. Unless the Lord builds the point, we who labor, labor in vain. Second, only as we rely on Christ will we see the church protected. The Lord has given his spirit and his word and his pastors to protect his people from the various evils that threaten them. His spirit guides us into all truth. His spirit unites us around Christ. His spirit works his power in us to change us to be more like Jesus. His word is an unchanging source of wisdom and truth that we can rely on in a world that is filled with all sorts of lies. Pastors are charged with handling God's word rightly 
staying aware of the threats that come from within and from without and making sure that we live a life that is worthy of the calling that we've been given. For us, as, a point, as the point, our race is not finished yet. Moral evils abound. Doctrinal drifts are all around us. They're an ever-present, ever-present temptation. So as a faith family, we have to be mindful of these things. We have to remain mindful of these things. We can't allow division among us. We cannot allow secret sins to fester among us. We cannot allow the cultural pressures to press in on us. Can't allow them to get the better of us. None of us, not a single one of us, can pridefully assume that we've arrived or would never do what that other person has done or that we as a church would ever do what that other church has done. We cannot pridefully assume these things. Until Christ returns, the church remains in hostile territory, and so as we rely on Jesus, we have to remain vigilant. Unless the Lord watches over the point, we who watch, watch in vain. Third, only as we rely on Christ will we see the church expand. No matter how we order our services on Sunday mornings, no matter how we organize our groups, no matter how we do our different ministries, no matter how we reach out to our community and how purposeful we are with that, only Jesus can take a person dead in their sins and bring them to life in Christ. Only him. We can pray, we can preach, we can love, we can reach out, we can host, we can stay faithful in all our ways, but only the Lord can transform a life. Only he can raise up the next generation of pastors and missionaries and godly men and godly women. Every Sunday, Every Sunday, we see that he's already doing it. Every Sunday, the people that you worship are around, the people that are around you and singing and praying and hearing God's word, opening it, that are in you with groups, every single one of them is a testimony that God is on the move at the point. God is working among us. We need him to work among us. Which means that and this is how I want to bring this to a close. You and I do not have to face the future with fear and anxiousness. For all the things in this world that will grapple for our attention and our apprehensions, the work of God in and through his church does not need to be one of them. Doesn't have to be that. Should we offer ourselves to be used by Jesus to build his church? Yes. Some of you need to hear that this morning. There, there are people across this room and across this campus who are serving in all sorts of ways. But maybe you've been attending for quite some time. Maybe you're a member, but really beyond attending a morning service, you're not involved with the life of our church. You've been given a gift by the Holy Spirit, at least one of the Holy Spirit, to be used among his people for the common good. Get off the sidelines. Get in the game. And be used as you rely on Jesus to build his church. Yeah. Should we remain aware of the threats that reside in us and around us? Yes. That begins with making sure your heart is right with the Lord. If you're dabbling in sin, if you're being casual with sin, flee from. Rely on the mercy of Christ. Make sure you are good with the Lord who welcomes you and loves to forgive and loves to empower for righteous living. He will do that for you. And make sure you're right with one another. Don't let division fester with you um, among, among you, all right? Don't, don't let it do that. If we as the local church would stay focused and live out what we see in Psalm 127, then we have to remember our place. The point belongs to him, not to us. He has the long-term vision and the blueprint for this faith family. He sets the agenda for what he wants done. He sets the agenda for how he wants it done, when he wants it done. And I'm grateful that we are all in this together at this moment in time. But all, all that you and I are really responsible for is daily offering ourselves to him and carrying out what he says in his word. Beyond that, what comes of that? Like, that's on him. That's on him. It's not on us. So we don't have to be anxious. We don't have to act like all of this depends on us. It doesn't. And I say this for myself. I say this for our staff. 
I say this for for you deacons and group leaders and next-gen leaders. I say this for the admin team and the tech team and the security team and the greeters and all all of you who serve in so many faithful, great ways. We must remember that the greatest need that this church has and that this community has is Jesus. It is not us. As Paul said, this is how you should regard us as servants of Christ. That's it. That's it. My task is to remain faithful. Your task is to remain faithful. And as we do, God will do the building. He'll do it how he wants and when he wants. And God will do the guarding. So we can rest knowing that our Father loves us in Christ Jesus.